We had a sermon request. I, I enjoyed them. The balance of praying for the physical and the spiritual. There's been a lot of physical things going on, yeah? It seems like there's always something going on. The timing of this couldn't have been better because, at least at North Collin, we've had email after email after email, it seems like, about someone suffering in the flesh, something going on, concerns, work issues, financial issues. It kind of never ends. Thank you. I'm alive, man, and they can hear me. appreciate you. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Thank you. So as I began to consider passages, I found myself in 3 John. John's writing to Gaius, and he put it this way. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Believe it or not, and I'm not talking about just in the church, in society at that time, that is a very standard greeting. If you're interested, if you want to nerd out a little bit about that. Uh, it was very normal that you would wish someone good health, that all may go well. But the reason why I wanted to focus in on this passage is that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. See, John's balancing this whole thing out. It was absolutely normal, and I don't think you need me to tell, tell you this, that 2,000 years ago, people cared about each other and how it was going for them and in good health. I just noticed, for example, I see Jack. It's like genuinely just good to see him. Does God care about what's happening in the physical realm? And I just need to go ahead and get this out of the way and make this point clear. Yes, yes, and yes. I mean, whenever Jesus, for example, is, is modeling a prayer, he's giving an example prayer. Our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread. I mean, I could, could I not just stop right there? If it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. It doesn't stop there. Listen, we can discuss, and I get it actually, James chapter 5, 14 and 15 is tricky. We have discussion about, are we talking about physical sickness or spiritual sickness? But there's, there, it, I'll tell you, at least for me, it's not a close cut case. It would not surprise me at all if brethren who are physically sick go to their elders to pray for them. That's not odd. Uh, I, I bet you hope that Rod and Billy care how you're doing physically. You know, Jesus' words in the Garden of Gethsemane, still I grapple with this because... <laughs> Um, there's several of us that have good conversation about Jesus' statement in the garden. Remove this cup from me, if it be your will, but not my will be done, your will be done. But at the end of the day, can we all agree on this, that that was a hard evening for Jesus? He cried out to his Father, and angels even ministered to him. I think we can agree on that. Paul says, you, you want to talk about revelations? I, I, have, I have revelations that have been given to me by God, but let me tell you what else I have. I have a, a thorn in the flesh. <laughs> Satan wants to use this thorn in the flesh to harass me. God's going to use it to keep me in check and humble me. But I'm telling you, I've got a thorn in the flesh. Three times I pleaded with the Lord, would you please remove this thorn in the flesh. And Jesus' answer is, my grace is sufficient. But he had a thorn in the flesh. I admire the Apostle Paul. I, I'm looking forward to seeing him one day. And what I've learned about his life through the scriptures 
is that if the Apostle Paul was complaining about this thing and was asking for it to be removed, it must have been something pretty burdensome. Because this guy was open to beatings, to shipwrecks, to being cold and without food and being betrayed and persecuted. He, he, but this thorn in the flesh, would you help me? And I see that. And can I just state something obvious? Jesus' miracles... <laughs> You know, I've, I've got to be par- careful because sometimes I think I have stressed too much how miracles were a sign for people to pay attention to Christ's authority in his position. It, so, no, now hear me, but that's right. <laughs> that's, that's right, and we need to acknowledge that. But brethren... When someone, for example, was healed in Jesus' names, whenever Jesus ascends back to the Father and the apostles are performing miracles, but they do it in the name of Jesus, will you tell me, if you're a person that was crippled from birth and someone says, rise and walk in the name of Jesus, you tell me, what do you think about Jesus now? Well, yes, You're going to think, I need to know him. He's got power. He's got authority. But he what? He's good. He cares about me. He healed me. Whenever Jesus looked at the people like sheep without a shepherd, the first thing you see him doing is he is curing their diseases. But here's the thing. Ah, here's the thing. He didn't cure every disease. He didn't right every physical wrong. He said, the poor, you're what? You're always going to have them with you. And I don't think that he felt good about that. He's just speaking in the most practical terms. Can I say something too before we transition that we want to remember, especially when you're reading the Old Testament, brethren, Israel, God's servant, he told them that if you are faithful to me, I will bless you. But see, I have a literal people living in a specific land. I will bless your livestock. I will bless you, your childbearing, your crops. I'll keep your enemies at bay. You see what I'm saying? If you decide that I can't trust, uh, uh, protect you anymore, that I'm not good anymore, then you will experience bad. And every way in which I bless you, reverse it now. Here's the thing, and now I've got to make the transition. We're not under the old law. Jews in a specific time and place in the land under this physical blessing. Now we transition, and Jesus now promises this, in this life, you will have trials and tribulations. So I'm, I'm looking at this text again, back in 3 John. I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Here's the question. What if your physical health reflected your spiritual See, he was so confident in Gaius. I want you to see this. I want, your spiritual health is so good, I pray that your physical matches it. See, what he was really pleased to hear is that his child, Gaius, was walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that you're faithful. What if, do, let me put it this way, do you, would you want me to pray, right, that your physical health matched your spiritual. If I prayed that prayer and God said, done, are you going, I think I've probably got about 60 more years. Or are you going, hey, you may want to call on the family. (laughs) It's time to say goodbye. Doc's giving me about 24 to 48. Because this is what, this is the transition that happens in the new covenant. And now it's these spiritual prayers, this spiritual focus. Um, Jesus, can I look at this passage? 
Peter, you love Peter. I'm not picking on Peter. Peter, you know, Jesus, who do the people say I am? Eh, they say you're this. Say, who do you say that I am? Oh, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Oh, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed to this, you to this, but, but my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. Mm, yes. But then Jesus, in verse 31, literally right after this, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, and that the scribes be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, okay? And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Can I just for a moment, guys, we look at Jesus as just so unbending and courageous and strong. Can we also allow him to be man? Do you know what would have been super helpful for, Peter, for Jesus if Peter would have said, Lord, I don't understand this, but I'm behind you. And if you say you've got to give your life, then you let me know what I can do to support you. And maybe Jesus would just say, just pray. But instead, no, 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 that's not going to happen to you. Peter, don't pull to, my, to the fleshly side. Get behind me. And then he says, calling the crowd to him with his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, it's pretty powerful wording here, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. What does it matter if you got everything? Lord, you can't give your life up. That's the most precious thing. What, what does it matter if I gain everything in the physical realm, but I forfeit my soul? What about you, right? So Luke chapter 16, it, it's the rich man and Lazarus, and he's, just, he's got wealth and he's eating good. And then here's Lazarus, and no one wants to be Lazarus, right? Do you want to be Lazarus? Poor eating crumbs off the table, sores, except for that whenever Lazarus closes his eyes, he's comforted. He has a heavenly escort that angels take him to Abraham's bosom. Rich guy had everything except for now he's tormented. It's okay to pray for bread. Give us this day our daily bread. But in John chapter 6, after Jesus multiplied the loaves, he says, you're not coming to me again because of the signs that I did. You didn't come to really feast on me. I'm the bread of life. You're, you're, you're laboring over bread. This thing perishes. It does not last. You eat it. You're hungry again. I'm the bread of life. Consume me, and you'll never be hungry and, oh, and here's the kicker. Bread. Like your fathers who ate that manna that God gave so long ago, they died. <laughs> Consume this bread and you'll never die. Brethren, it's okay. My brother, let me, let me tell you, because I, I want to be so very careful lest I seem callous about this. I'm not callous. Basically, all my family is dead on my side, save my two brothers and aunt and a mom. Dad died when he had just turned 60. My dear old dad died, and he still had his, his happy birthday balloon floating by his deathbed. I get it. I get it. I've had scares of my own. My brother, your shepherd right now, has got another eye surgery. I hope that that recovers for him. I got a brother-in-law that breathed his last breath at 30 years old. I get it. I get it. There are times in my life where I don't want to exaggerate this, but it, we were poor. We were poor. Spent a little bit of time living in some scary neighborhoods. I, I get it. 
I get it. But there's just something greater. There's just, matter of fact, what it has taught me is I love people. Relationships is the most precious thing to me. And I want to make sure that I'm okay and you're okay so that we don't have to break up this social party. We can continue it on for eternity. I'm okay with saying goodbye to you temporarily. Are you okay with saying goodbye to me temporarily? What I can't bear is saying goodbye to you forever. And of course, more importantly than all of that, is our relationship with the Lord. So yeah, you know, Jesus heals a man that's born, that, 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 that can't see. But what he really saw is who Jesus is. And the text says that he worshiped Jesus. And he says, I believe in you. But see, the religious leaders, they say, oh, we can see just fine. Ah, uh, Jesus says, well, now that you say that you see, mm, we got a problem. Yeah, you can physically see, but you're blind as a bat. Um, there are worse things in life than losing limbs. My dad was a double amputee before he died. I, I, I use that as an excuse to make fun of anyone that has, that's lost a limb. I go, oh, it's okay, my dad was a double amputee. We gotta, please laugh at that, because you're making me feel horrible. <laughs> our family has always had a very dark sense of humor. My dad, our cheesy story is that when he woke up, the first day his, his first leg was taken off. He asked the nurse if they were having problems with, with, uh, with theft. <laughs> so you, saw, you see where that one's going. What, what, what are you missing? He's like, I woke up and my leg was taken. You know, so we're also not funny, as you can also see <laughs> through, through this sermon. I'm going to stick to preaching and not stand up. Um, you know, Jesus says, I, I want you to watch your heart, for example, and, and lusting. I, I'd rather you rip your eye out and cut your, your hand off. Better to do that. I mean, he's, you know, don't... <laughs> But better to do that than your whole body be thrown into hell. There are worse things. Uh, I love, I love my, my family, and I love my tradition, and I love what we're about. And Jesus says, man, I love that too. But here's the thing. If it's contrary to me, if you don't love me more, then you're not worthy of me. You're... you're, you're you're living in a physical world, and I get it. And your mom and your dad and your siblings are people that you can see and you can touch. I get that. I, I love my family to the moon and back. But they also know this. I will follow Jesus over them. Sorry. My mom's not here because she's following the flesh. And that's why I'm not with her. I will follow Jesus over her. I love her. I pray for her. I'll do anything for her. But she will not reign in my life. He saved me, not her. I, 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 I'm, I'm saying, brethren, I get it. I want you to know I get it. I'm with you. I'm not trying to belittle these things. You know, we got a problem in 1 Corinthians where brethren were suing each other over trivial matters. Paul says, can't you just take a loss? Can we take a loss? Um, let me ask you something. On the surface, King Solomon had all the wealth and the wisdom and the, wis and the women. Do you think that King David would have been proud to see the end of his son? How many people have you met in this life and they start bragging about their kids and all their physical accomplishments, all their physical accomplishments? Ask them how their family's doing. <laughs> Ask them how their relationships are with their kids. I like to know that kind of stuff. Ask them how their faith in the Lord is. What, what does it matter if you gain all the money, 
the power, the raises, but you lose your kids. Jesus wasn't interested in building barns. Remember that? This guy's looking at all of his ample goods. I'm going to tear down these barns and big. I know, I'm sorry. At this point, I'm like, you know these, don't you? You know all of these. I'm, I'm realizing as I go through this, this happens sometimes in a sermon. This is overkill, isn't it? It's overkill. Okay, so you know this. You fool, tonight your soul's required of you. How's your gold going to save you? Okay. Paul says, I'm telling you right now, Everything that I, that I accomplished, everything in the flesh, I count them as rubbish. Because the gift of knowing Jesus, it's just, I look at it now and it's just rubbish. So I found myself kind of coming to the end here and back to Matthew 6. You cannot serve God and money and then he goes into this example of being anxious. Why are you anxious? Saying, what am I going to eat? What, what am I going to wear? What am I going to put on? Jesus says, you don't need to worry about these things. Your father knows you need them. He knows your needs. And as Jesus sums that portion up, he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Do you hear that too? Listen, can I say this? I always like saying this in my own words so I understand what, what he's saying. I'm going to give you, these things will be taken care of. I just, I don't need you worrying about the actual needs in life. It's done. I just need you keeping your eye on the ball. So my, my answer to this, how do we balance it? He cares about the physical, but he clearly prioritized the spiritual. The question has been answered. Guys, how much control do we actually have in this life? It just feels like more and more zero. <laughs> just when you think you got your hands on the reins and God humbles you. So I, my, my, thank you for your attention. I'm done this morning. My question is, I'm going to read in between the lines that some of you, if you're struggling with this, why are you so anxious? What are you anxious about? What's bothering you? I also, this is kind of odd, but I want to hit something specifically because it pertains to this local fellowship. We have some here who suffer with OCD. I happen to be one of them. But some of you in particular, and this is not my, how mine works, but you, you're scared, you have a lot of anxiety about what's going to happen in the physical realm pertaining to hurting others, getting others sick, people dying. Continue to work on that and get help on that because it's going to cause you to be unbalanced and it's going to rip your peace I'm not getting on to you I'm, I'm saying I'm, I'm one of you I'm one of the weirdos yay OCD ears but what I'm saying is that it's going to rip your joy up. for others I, I think it's probably going to come down to a couple of things and maybe ultimately I mean is it just a trust issue right like do we trust that God is going to work this out and the final thing and I'm closing with this are you afraid to close your eyes could it be that we're just hanging on to the physical side so much because we're afraid to pass on from this life to the next? Quit worrying about politics. Quit worrying about the next paycheck. Quit, quit worrying about decisions that other people are going to make if they choose 
to dig their own graves. I'm sorry to say it this way. You let them dig their own grave. Oh, it's my son. You let your son dig his own grave. I mean, be there. <laughs> Try to help them. But stop being anxious. Boy, isn't that even as I say it, <laughs> that sounds so ridiculous. But we have them. Jesus is trying to comfort us. If you have it, will you speak to someone here so we can help you get out of that pit and bring security back into your life? Because God doesn't want that for you. Thank you so much for your attention. If you need to respond to the gospel, do so as together we stand and we sing.